of stories, but hey, I was born have... with the H chromosome. I love the being born with the H chromosome thing. That's like super funny. <laughs> um, so let's take see. two. <laughs> hey everybody, I am Alicia Bus. I am the horse. <laughs> oh, you gotta leave that in. I'm the horse of face. <laughs> the horse face? <laughs> oh my gosh. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we'll have like the blooper reel. You are the horse power behind. Oh it. my gosh. Well, this morning, I just, <laughs> my, my brain and my mouth are like, what are we doing today? Um, <laughs> it was your idea. <laughs> it was my idea. It was. And you are not wrong. <laughs> <Take three. laughs> Good morning, everybody. I am Alicia Boss. I'm the host of Horse Power Empowerment Through Connection. And today I have the great honor and privilege of getting to interview my friend, Michelle Pickel, who is the founder of Horse Powered Reading in Alino Lakes, Minnesota. We had a lot of fun laughing before this. Uh, we've had to try this beginning like three different times because, you know, some mornings are just like that. Put the teeth in. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Everything's fine. It's fine. There's, we don't ever make mistakes here. Mm -mm, nope. Mm -mm. That doesn't happen. We uh, fail forward. We fail forward. We fail forward. It's a beautiful thing um, to get to model for people how we get to be brave. And even in recordings after like 40 something interviews, uh, the beginning <laughs> can still totally get <laughs> bobbled. Um, so Michelle has this amazing program where she's integrated reading with horses. It's based off the Egala model. And she's been, she started with the Egala model in 2007 and then horse powered reading in 2012. But before we get into all of that amazing information about how she connects that to core educational standards um, and science, because we love to bring science into our conversations here on horse power and empowerment through connection. Let's talk to Michelle a little bit about what like where she began in her journey with horses. And thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you. I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa and I was born with the H chromosome is what I tell people because I, there's never been a time when I didn't crave horses, being around them in some way, shape or form. Very small snippets of time through my life. It, I've, I've not been able to be near them, but I've been blessed with a husband who has hauled horses. He was in church work for 23 years, so we moved around the country. So he hauled horses from Iowa to Wisconsin, to Oklahoma, to Montana, to Missouri, and ultimately to Minnesota. And so the good Lord has allowed me to have horses that whole time, starting awesome. with a little tiny pony when I was 10. What was your pony's name? Oh, he was so sweet. My dad, I prayed for him for five years, you know, at least five years out my window at the first star. And he was so small. My dad picked him into the front porch, picked him up the step. And so, of course, we named him Tiny Tim. Oh, and that's so we we rode I rode the legs off of him until I was probably 13. Oh, wow. Got, got a horse horse. So. I've been very blessed. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I love that. That's just such a like, precious image. <laughs> um, so were you writing in college? Like what type of writing did you do? Whatever I had to do to stay on the horse. My first horse that I got when I was in junior high. Stop writing. <laughs> my, my, my dad liked to call, my grandpa liked to call her a wild Arab. And she was, she was a half Arabian and it took three people for me to get on. And one in front and one on the other side to keep her from moving away and one to help me get into the stirrup. And then I went directly to a plowed field so that she wouldn't, wouldn't run away with me. So every mistake possible I made on that horse and every lesson I learned, I'm convinced my horses made me a better teacher. When I ultimately became a teacher, uh, they were my first and best instructors. And now they haven't failed me and they have 
taught children, not just my horses, but what I learned from my horses and have passed on to other people, have taught children all over the world now. And um, it's thrilling. Uh, when I just got a letter, uh, uh, an email from a friend, a principal in Australia, who asked if she could have my address, mailing address, so one of her students could write me a letter. And awesome. then she followed up by saying that after her first, this little girl's first horsepowered reading session, her reading just took off and she never looked back. Now that's a pretty amazing. That's a beautiful story. Amazing story, but the, the stories from kids who were visually impaired, a little girl who was blind watching her learn where the neck of a pony was. She had no concept that the neck wasn't in the middle of its body because she of course was born blind and couldn't see. So uh. the assumption is this is where my head is. That must be where the pony's neck is holding his head. So when she had read in braille, the vocabulary word neck and she began to look for the neck she was in the middle of the pony's back so they gave her a hint that you can hug it gradually as she worked her way up toward the neck and she was able to completely hug that pony's neck the look on her face it just brought tears it was amazing so i have been able to through what I learned from my horses, I've been able to share that with other people to help children learn and grow. Incredible. Now, how many countries do you have horsepowered reading in now? There have been people trained in 13 different countries. And when I saw uh, <laughs> a woman do Japanese vocabulary words with the children, oh, not they weren't children, they were of developmentally delayed adults with ponies and they were working on basic vocabulary they were miniature horses she took into tokyo oh wow and one woman who had previously been very disconnected from the activities when she brought the ponies in this time she engaged with the ponies and with the words blew my mind i always wondered if it would work in other languages and now um, we're getting ready to launch classes in Spanish in Argentina and Chile. And uh, we're getting uh, books that have been written by uh, a woman in Oman, the country of Oman near the Red Sea. And uh, another woman in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. She's the one that created the video that's on the website, the Horsepower Reading website, horsepowerreading.com. I love seeing the equine work globally. It's just, it's so beautiful how people come together from all over the world. I'm very grateful. It is, it's exciting. And then there's, there are people that have been trained in 44 states in the U.S. as well. So. Uh, We've got six more to go. Where, we, where do we need to go? I, know. I want to go to Hawaii. I just tried, I just talked to somebody in Hawaii who joined the Facebook group uh, saying, you know, I really would love to have an excuse. I might do an in-person training in Hawaii. <laughs> there you go. I mean, if you need an assistant, I feel like I could make that sacrifice. You could you. do that. I, I could I, do that. I could. It would be okay. <laughs> you live I've in actually Hawaii. never been to Hawaii. It's one of the last three states that I have left. Yeah. Hawaii, and Alaska, and Kansas. I, I'd love to do, I, I know people in Alaska, but we haven't moved into that. And another, strangely enough, Arkansas. There's nobody That's a beautiful to state. Yes. It Lots is. of horses too. Yeah. I feel like it's just one of those states that we don't get to hear about very often. Mm -hmm. It's like this so hidden you can, little gem you in the can, south. You can see most of the, uh, I think I've got the list of the countries in the find a page, find a program page on the horsepowerreading.com website. That's really cool. So you are a trained teacher. I'm, I am actually a professor. My doctorate is in education and urban policy studies in education, but my specialty is literacy education. And the courses that I teach at Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota are teaching of literacy, 
and educational psychology and another class called teaching the faith because we train teachers for um, Lutheran classrooms and uh, private classrooms. So the teaching of literacy and the educational psychology just really came together. And then when I supervised student teachers and I would hear them come back with stories of children who had this reading difficulty or that reading difficulty and we'd talk about, okay, these are the things that you can do. I got so frustrated because we know how to fix it. We know what to do with this problem. Why isn't it happening in the classroom? So of course my poor students, uh, they, I was preaching to the choir, I'm sure, because they were learning about these strategies and these uh, the research and why it should be the way it should be and going out into the schools and trying to implement it in a place where too often the testing and the lockstep curriculum coming down from on high inhibits the teacher or limits the amount of time they have to help those students who are struggling. Yeah. And in particular, the kids who just learn in a different way. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't learn well sitting quietly and listening to the teacher talk. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, experiential education is really important for people of all ages. Yes, yes. Um, can you tell us more about like what brought you to EGALA? My husband, strangely enough, actually, I was fascinated. I started with the Pirelli program. I was really fascinated with that. And I had a I had an Arab that I'd raised from, uh, I think we got him when he was, he wasn't a year old yet. And as he got to be two and I started working with him and he thought I was his mama, we separated him because of an injury from another horse when we first brought him home. So he was separated, thought I was his herd and, or his mama, I'm not sure which, but when he would spook or get scared, he'd try to jump in my arms essentially. And, <laughs> That's a very dangerous thing. And I, as a result, I got, uh, he stepped on my leg at one point and I had cellulitis and it, my whole leg up to my knee turned green. It was really scary. Yeah, and yeah. I was, a, I knew that I didn't know enough. And so I got the Pirelli program and two weeks later, it was a relationship like none others to this day. He's 18 now. But I learned how to teach boundaries, and those boundaries are so important, not yeah. just for horses, but in so many areas of life. And then one, uh, one of the people, my friend Annette, who was working in the mail room at Concordia, strangely enough, she had gone to a program called OK Corral, mm -hmm. and, and the Igala model, the, he was part with Lynn Thomas at the beginning, and um, she said, you really should go if you ever have a chance. And you've got to be sure and volunteer to be the client, the volunteer client. So I did. I went to my first Igala program, volunteered to be the client, and had this huge breakthrough and was bawling my eyes out, even though it wasn't supposed to be a real session. The horses did their work, and it gave me insights into things that were really important uh, in my life at that time. And uh, incredibly powerful. So that was it. I was sold. And of course, you have to always go to more than one uh, EGALA training because the first one, your, your mind is so busy working on your own stuff, you have a hard time taking it all in because it yeah. is so powerful. The metaphors that naturally come from interaction with the horses. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And then, so that was 2007. That was 2007, and, and then, then I kept five saying, years later. <laughs> my goodness, there's so many parallels, and once you see the metaphors, you cannot unsee them. So every time I was with my horses doing an igala thing uh, with people with um, whether it's depression, whether it was alcohol or drug abuse, uh, substance abuse of any kind these metaphors would come up and of course they always crept into my teaching at the university because I, I, it was a word picture I could paint 
and clarify things and the lessons that they had to teach. There were so many parallels. It was, you couldn't miss them. And so then when the children, when I would hear about these struggling readers and I would show the teacher in the classroom, when I go visit my student teacher, I remember sitting with a fourth grade teacher and showing her how to use the phonograms, the word families to help a little boy who in fourth grade couldn't read even those basic uh, words. And so I was teaching a graduate course in elementary uh, literacy and I told the teachers, you know, I really think this could help. I really think I could use the horses to help children who are struggling with reading, but I just need somebody to practice with. And I, I need a volunteer to practice with. And one teacher said, I've got just the little boy. I can't figure out what's going on with him. Um, and it's been, it's February and I still don't know why he's not hooking on to this first grade. So that little boy and his neighbor who was in third grade were my first two clients that I practiced with starting in February. It was a strangely warm spring in Minnesota that year. And after the first session, I called the teacher to tell her what I thought I was seeing and long pause after I got done talking. And she said, in one hour, you were able to find out what has taken me more than half the school year to figure out. And it's because the horses provide this academic x-ray by the way they interact, by the way the student interacts with the horse and the way the horse responds. You get such a picture of how they truly feel about reading and reading instruction and, and, and academics in general. Now that's so, really beautiful. And like what's some of the science behind that? The, the, the herd behavior, because horses are, you know, they're sentient creatures and, and because they're prey animals, they have to be hypersensitive and aware of everything in their surroundings. And it, that extra sensory perception, I guess you might say, it works to find the the anxiety, the the hesitancy, the difficulties in in the children as well, and the way that the children attempt to solve problems, if they give up quickly, if they're persistent through the challenges, those kinds of things you can begin to see those. So just the science of the predator prey is one piece of why that works so well but then just being in the arena with the horses for the children instead of being so self-conscious and feeling that they can't do anything they actually have a being who's right there interacting with them and it opens their mind enough and it gets at the stuff that's been blocking them from learning whether it's that low motivation the belief i can't do anything anyway they don't want to read they don't think they can read and often they don't persist long enough they have that low persistence they they fail and they give up because yeah. they, 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 they're convinced that they are a failure and that's how they see themselves. But once they figure out, I can move this thousand pound horse, I can make it go where I want, when I want. And it's pretty amazing. And the relationship then that builds, that kind of relationship we want to see between them and characters in a story when they're reading there's so many metaphors that you can begin to build on <clears throat> that it unblocks the channels, if you will, uh, of learning. And so often, a, my hypothesis as I've done this more and more and seen more and more uh, is that most children who are struggling learners and struggling at reading, they've had some drama or trauma 
around the time when they were supposed to have been learning those foundational skills, whether it was in the school, the way the teacher was teaching, something in their home, maybe a divorce, maybe a health issue amongst themselves or a family member, maybe moving schools, moving communities, something happened during that time that took all of their cognitive energy to cope with. Yeah. So they didn't have enough left to be able to learn what they needed to learn to build that foundation that the other teachers think that they already know when they get into fourth grade and they can't read those basic words. Right. Yeah. And then isn't there a chemical reaction that happens when people get around horses and their brains? Oh, I, I, I think just the release of the endorphins and that, you know, that whole uh, serotonin and uh, the chemicals that, that bring that excitement and that joy, those, and you maybe know more even about the brain research. I have to look at my cheat sheets when I want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> but your brain, it just opens up the channels for most children. Does it work for every child? I would say yes, but not in the same way. Sometimes there are different things that parents think the child needs or the teacher thinks the child needs, and that's not the problem at all. Sometimes the problem is so simple that people aren't seeing it. Like the little girl, when one of the activities where they set up what gets in the way of reading, the road to reading, the obstacle course, uh, they have to decide what gets in their way of becoming a great reader. And this little girl wrote the word hungry on one of the obstacles, mm. which was so puzzling because her family, obviously, she, from looking at her and knowing the family, there was no shortage of food. She wasn't malnourished in any way. Well, when asked about it, she said, reading is right before lunch and I can smell the food cooking and I'm so hungry. I just can't concentrate on reading. Wow. Mom started sending a snack to school. Problem solved. It was <laughs> now she had a, a, another challenge. Uh, that she didn't wouldn't ask questions when she needed help. That was another challenge that we worked on as well. But, but the first one that was a real easy fix. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. Oh, that's funny. Now you have partnered with somebody else, so it's not just about reading, right? There are other subjects that you can use the concept uh, and structure of horse powered reading with. Well, when you think about the fact that horse-powered reading is really built on those, uh, the key concepts behind the EGALA model, we, we work with a team approach. We work with um, the idea that, well, it's all on the ground, and also the idea that that student within themselves can discover solutions to the problems. So we set up an activity or set up the, the environment with the particular reading skill that we're working on and then step back and hold the space while the horse and the, the child Navigate. take the problems, put it out there and they manipulate it and use it. So I've been doing the horse powered reading for a little while and I met Nancy Lyon, one of, uh, she was in class I want to say maybe number 11. Out of, 30, of out of 38? Yes, we're getting ready to start class 38 this, this tonight. And um, so she was one of the earlier classes and her specialty was math. She worked in a juvenile detention center and uh, taught middle schoolers, high schoolers math, skills that they maybe were lacking. And so it was natural for her to take these activities, which the horse powered reading activities are built around a combination of some of the activities that people use in EGALA sessions, some of the activities that we use that are in my um, teaching of literacy textbook, the reading strategies, I take those and I 
make them um, in, I make them appropriate for the arena. We just shuffle things around so they become very experiential. And so she took some of those activities and just simply overlaid the math skills into it. And then I had another group where I had seventh graders that came out from a school that were primarily immigrant families. These, it was a global school and they wanted to bring all the seventh graders out. Well, there were 40 of them, too many for one session. So we talked about half one week and half another week. They came for four mornings, 20 kids at a time. And while I was in the arena working on some reading skills, the other teachers were outside the arena and they were working with science and art and um, of course, we touched on history and language arts, highway poetry, things like that. So definitely good teaching is good teaching is good teaching. And educational psychology, those theories and skills uh, as it relates to motivation, as it relates to how students learn, all of that, my years of teaching the educational psychology have been folded into it. So yes, indeed, there are so many directions. Like I tell anybody who takes the course, what you get, the, I, the curriculum, I, when they buy the curriculum, the curriculum, just consider this as a seed that you're gonna plant into your program and it'll grow according to what the soil is and what the needs are, what the environment needs. So you start with those ideas and then you, with your creativity, you're gonna branch out and you're going to, it will become a, a, a different beautiful flower or, or plant and blossom where it grows, where it's planted. Oh, so, I, I love that. So you think that it would be possible for us to create um, equine assisted learning activities for K through 12 to match core educational standards for every subject matter for schools? As a matter of fact, my dream school is a school that is built all around with a stable, with an indoor arena, classrooms on one side for things like technology and um, to starting points for some lessons that you want to do in the classroom, but also opening up the environment and having the horses be an integral part of any piece of education. I don't know that the horses need to be the be all end all, but they can be the trigger, they can be the um, teachers that can break through to, to students who learn differently. And in fact, right now, this week, I think, uh, one of our, one of the students who completed course number, class number 37, Chantal, Chantal, Chantel, she's going to be working with a small school in Australia that has kids that struggle with behavior issues and at risk population. And they have a variety of animals that they use and she's gonna be taking horse powered reading into that school. Another, there are several schools in Australia that have begun to just integrate it into their programs. The school in Canada, north, far northern Alberta, Canada, worked with horse-powered reading over the course of three years, and we, were, we did research during those three years, collected pre and post data each time, each six to eight week period when they implemented the horse-powered reading curriculum with different grade levels. And we worked with different um, control and experimental groups, but the curriculum has activities for the arena uh -huh. for specific skills and then parallel classroom activities that the teachers can follow up with and build upon and and uh, some teachers use it independent even of the horses if they don't have access to the horses so yeah definitely you can use it in to help the kids who learn differently and in this pandemic, in this time of COVID right now, um, students who have difficulty being online learning, it's a perfect opportunity for our horsepower reading people to have students in a safe 
outdoor socially distanced manner and let the horses join in the instructional activities. They can do some uh, the, the paper pencil kinds of things outside the arena and then help implement and make those lessons stick deeper inside the arena. And then they, they just uh, develop this symbiotic relationship, the out of arena experiential inside the arena. And then one of the fascinating pieces of horsepower reading that I learned in the first couple years that we were doing it was the power of the latency effect, how the things that the student, students did in our summer school when we did a research project with a special ed summer school program in Wyoming, we went back about four and a half months later to see the impact that it had then. And almost every parent, teacher, talked about the incredible improvement in not just reading, but every subject by their student, their attitudes and their eagerness to read and experience school activities. And I see it again and again and again that the reading skills are just one small part, but when the horses add the motivation, the self-efficacy, and the persistence through challenges, that rolls into this huge snowball that then the, the student now goes to school feeling I'm capable, I can do this. And then things begin to stick and it's built that sticky schema and giving them some background knowledge that, that then grows and builds. Oh, so, that's fantastic. And do you feel like this work can be done virtually? It does. It, it, there, I've seen some amazing things where people have a um, little boy in one of the classes. I don't know. You may have been in that class. We had the video of the facilitator sitting on the ground with a pony and the book. And the child had the book and was reading to the pony. Aww. And the engagement was, of the pony was cool. But then when mom said, I've never heard him read that fluently before. He had struggled so much with fluency, but when he was just reading to the horse, that was so powerful for him. And there have been other people who, uh, who take the electronic device into the arena and they can become the hands and the feet of the, the student outside who's in a uh, isolated place back at home with their iPad. Yeah. That student can direct the person who's in the arena with the actual horse. So there have been quite a few instances of that also, even with just photographs or videos uh, that people have taken of the horse, and then it, you bring the metaphors out. Um, what's that look like in school? Two ponies were rearing up and playing. The, the owner said that they were playing together, but a student might say they're fighting. They're mad at each other because of this, or this one's bullying that horse. And those are issues that definitely can get it in the way of student learning. Yeah. What are some of the obstacles that you found in your journey to creating horsepowered reading so that you were able to overcome those things and live your dream of providing the service to the world? It was an interesting journey that I, <laughs> there, there is a Bible verse that says, um, uh, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. And and I thought, oh, this is such a wonderful thing. Uh, I should share this with the university. So I wanted to do an online class. When I realized that I had people scattered throughout the United States who, the states who wanted to learn how to do this. And rather than make all of them come to me or to one other isolated place, if I could, in fact, this, these were friends from Acres for Life who suggested, can't you do this online? And I'm like, ding. So I approached the university about it and they, the person in charge at that time was kind of uncomfortable with it. And he said, 
uh, something to do with liability, which I absolutely couldn't understand because it would be their horses in their place. So anyway, he said, but uh, you can certainly use our, our platform, video platform, to do the class. And there's a free Blackboard that you could use. And I was furious. I was just furious. I thought, well, that pulls that. I, steam was coming out my ears when I left. But he also said, well, then you can just charge what you want to charge and you can um, get the profit. So the more I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe this could work. Of course, I was scared of online teaching. I didn't know how to do it very well at all. But the more I thought about it, this allowed me to keep the price point low enough, lower than some people think it should be. But I wanted to get it out there. My yeah. goal is to make a positive difference in the lives of these struggling readers. They shouldn't have to struggle. We know how to help them. And so I wanted to get this out to the hands of people who could help the children in their communities. So that was the beginning uh, where I started uh, doing online courses. And I started out doing maybe two, maybe three a year was all, but I try to keep them to eight people because the point of it is you're going to learn about reading you're going to learn about the theories behind it but then most importantly you will have a volunteer client that you're going to do an activity with that we will debrief and then you're going to try it again and we debrief again so you'll have two experiences going into it instead of saying oh i'm not ready i'm not ready yes you will do it or you won't get your certification of horsepower reading and um, just the kids alone who've been helped through those classes, the stories, the gal in Argentina watching her work in Spanish and children, two girls who were just kind of lackadaisical and they wouldn't do anything. They didn't want to go forward and follow the instructions. So they turned it into a treasure hunt for the second session. The first session, this or that didn't work. So they tried making it a treasure hunt to, to um, that the students were responsible for moving forward. And it was amazing the things that the kids learned. And that's the, and now that it's the mother of those children now that has translated the class into Spanish and will be teaching in Argentina, teaching other people how to do horsepower reading. That's fantastic. I just, there's so much there to get to unpack. There's so many exciting things. Are you still seeing clients yourself? Unfortunately, because of health issues with parents, my parents right now, I very limited um, people that contact me. I can, I do have opportunity to work with, but um, because of needing to travel and support aging parents. No, and totally uh, understand. It, 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 it's interesting, but it's very much the thing that I, that makes it feel okay to me is, it's just like when I went from teaching kindergarten, which I absolutely loved. I'd been teaching uh, what they used to call remedial reading. Uh, and then I got to teach kindergarten, which I love early childhood education. And I'd been teaching that and, but I wanted to make a difference in the lives of kids. I, I could, had the opportunity to come to Concordia University. And I, my theory was, yes, I could teach just this group of kindergartners each year, or if I used my um, administrator's license, I could teach a school or a school district but at concordia i get to teach the teachers who will become the administrators and who have that outreach so if i can impact them the future teachers that gives me a bigger reach and in the same way i can teach a very limited number of people myself on my little tiny farm or I can teach other people how to do horse powered reading and reach all the way around the world yeah. and reach students, blind and visually impaired students or students who speak Spanish or Japanese or, or Arabic. And so awesome. that's fun. 
Well, thank you for all of that. So we shall, one last question for today's interview. Who is it that inspires you? Well, my ultimate inspiration, of course, is, is uh, the, my savior, you know, God, who calls me, who I really believe has brought together all the pieces, all of the experiences that I've had, all of the failures or um, course corrections. They've all been very intentional, even to the point of the man that I married. I'm convinced God said, that's who you're marrying. And if I had, didn't have him, a very few men, I think, would have hauled my horses all over the country. <laughs> I would have not been able to keep them because it, it's not a small thing. And we were not, did not make a lot of money. So um, that I'm convinced that it, is, it truly is a calling. But one, I am so inspired by Lynn Thomas and what she's done with the EGALA model and how she's grown that. I've, I've, conferenced with her, visited with her on numerous occasions, just, you know, how did you do this? Because this, when horsepower reading started, it was crazy. Uh, nobody had done it. And actually, to this day, I haven't found any other programs that are actually teaching reading skills or helping set the environment to learn and reinforce skills. So I have great admiration for her. And then of course there are an untold number of incredible authors that have inspired me. And, and bottom line, all of the horsepowered reading family, everybody who I've had the privilege of meeting and working with, a piece of them has been molded into what horsepowered reading is now. The things that you see on my website, they're not all original. And in the Horsepower Reading family, when, you, when you're joining this family, the understanding is that I share everything I have with you. The curriculum, you can use it in your marketing. You can use it in your publicity. Just make sure the website is always there so they can come back to the source if they ever want training themselves. But their ideas, we need them. We, I want to be able to take your ideas and share it with other horsepowered reading people. That's why if you join the horsepowered reading Facebook group, you'll see lots of really cool ideas that are enriching those little tiny beginning seeds that I built into the curriculum to start with. Other people are taking these and putting their experiences like the math, yeah. the horsepowered math putting their experiences into it. Now we're getting these wonderful set of books from, from Ilham in Oman, who people will be able to use, will be building um, activities around those so they can add them to their resources. So it's so much more than one person. It's all of the horsepowered reading family. That's why my name's not in it. It's horsepoweredreading.com is the website, not Michelle Piquel website. Yeah. Because it's not about me. Yeah. No, that's really beautiful. And I love how you pull everybody in and it's just, everybody gets to be on an equal playing field and valued at the same level. And it's, I feel grateful to get to be a part of it. And for the time that you've taken out of your busy day today to spend with us and sharing your message, it's just really fantastic. And, and we'll I make sure and have it in the description um all the links so people can find you and and thank you so much for providing this platform and this opportunity to be able to share You're very not just welcome. horsepower reading but so many other people's uh work that are benefiting thank you those. yeah you're very welcome it's really a gift to me as well because i get to learn so much from each individual person that's on my show um so it's, it's fun it's fun yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for watching or for listening today. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.